I felt like maybe I should do the talk after lunch right away, but um, that was so wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Green. I, um, again, have nothing to declare or disclose, and you're going to be tired of seeing this model before the day is over, but I do want to remind you that it's, uh, it's not known at this point in time whether it's a misdirected immune response because of the cross-reactive antibodies or it's a true autoimmune response, and I believe that it's actually probably both. It, it literally becomes an autoimmune process after the antibodies have crossed the blood-brain barrier and, and are maintained within the brain, particularly because, as you've just heard from Dr. Day, there's such a host of symptoms that can occur in the various autoimmune encephalitides. And we did a study uh, early in my time at the NIH looking at symptoms of obsessive-compulsive disorder among patients with lupus. Even without frank lupus cerebritis, the patients had 60% chance of having obsessive compulsive behaviors as well as anxiety. And what was fascinating about this uh, cohort of about 65 adults with systemic lupus was the fact that there was a, they divided into two groups, not categorized, just divided into two groups. Those whose symptoms, uh, psychiatric symptoms improved as their physical symptoms improved on steroids and immunosuppressive therapies, and those whose symptoms actually got worse. And probably the most poignant was a woman who was on very high dose immunosuppression to try and keep her uh, lupus nephritis under control, but she was spending eight hours a day vacuuming her carpet to try and get the lines exactly right. So in the PANDAS cohort, we worked from a model that there might be three different levels of autoimmunity. And you heard from Dr. Cunningham that there's actually evidence that these cross-reactive antibodies react with uh, neuronal cells. They do have to get across the blood-brain barrier somehow, and what we know about group A strep is it's a particularly powerful uh, in breaking the blood-brain barrier some, through some of the exotoxins. Regional reports, we depend primarily on patholo pathological reports from Sydenham's Korea among patients who actually died of their rheumatic heart disease, but also had Sydenham Korea, and those pathology reports showed uh, significant striatal inflammation and with uh, endothelial cuffing and a great deal of evidence that the blood-brain barrier was broken down in the caudate and putamen. I'll show you our volumetric changes which we have interpreted as uh, suggesting inflammation within the basal ganglia, particularly because of improvements, as well as PET evidence from Dr. Harry Shugani. And neuropsychological abnormalities are a, a more um, nonspecific clue, but they do provide some at least temporal suggestions of dysfunction within the basal ganglia during acute illness. And then the final level was systemic, so moving out to some of our treatments, they suggest, uh, because of their immunomodulatory actions, that autoimmunity may be playing a role in this. So the MRI evidence came from a study that Jay Geed and uh, our group did, sorry, demonstrating that among patients in the PANDAS subgroup, there was uh, increased size of the caudate, putamen, and globus pallidus as compared with a group of healthy controls, a group of children, as well as a contrast group of children with non-PANDAS OCD. You've heard about the antineuronal antibody story. I think it's going to work because uh, they were kind enough to give me my own computer. And this is what we were talking about before, that infection of the mice and then passive transfer of the antibodies by passive transfer of serum resulted in these stereotypic backflips of the mice, hyperactivity, and the uh, manipulation of the food pellets and the other things you heard from Dr. Cunningham. Well, that is actually known as Witebsky's criterion for an autoimmune disorder, is that the production of symptoms by a passive transfer of antibodies fulfills the last criterion. I used to always talk about how this fulfilled Koch's postulates for an infectious disease, but I was told that that actually, um, because they weren't transferring the strep, only the antibodies, that Wojtebski was the better uh, source. At the NIH in 1999, we published a trial, a relatively small group, and it was criticized for its smallness, but in actual fact, we had such 
uh, statistically significant results, it, was, it would have been uh, inappropriate to continue after this cohort of patients because we showed very clearly that sham IVIG or placebo had no effect in this group of very carefully selected uh, children and adolescents with PANDAS. Nine of them were randomized to receive IVIG. They're shown on the left side. At baseline, they had a mean Y-box score, excuse me, of about 34, with a 45% reduction during some, uh, f one month after treatment with two grams per kilogram of IVIG, uh, administered as one gram per kilogram on each of two consecutive days. That's sort of standard treatment for uh, Kawasaki's and other illnesses. The placebo group received infusions exactly the same. The pharmacy sent the bottles up in wrapped in aluminum foil. The tubing was wrapped in aluminum foil. The patients, um, nine of these 10 that received the placebo on their post-discharge, or excuse me, discharge interview, nine of the 10 thought that they had gotten active treatment, probably because all of the patients were pretreated with uh, Benadryl, Tylenol and other drugs to prevent any kind of reaction to the IVIG since it was a double blind placebo condition and we kept them in bed for two days and they felt pretty crappy when they left the hospital. So they thought they had gotten active treatment until they came back to us one month later and they had had no improvement. Now older studies of OCD, the placebo rates were like this, very, very, very low. The newer trials, placebo rates have actually increased they thought in uh, drug trials in uh, general OCD that it may be because of the comorbid anxiety and depression, but obsessions and compulsions tend to be quite treatment uh, placebo resistant. The plasma exchange group was the most remarkably improved, and that was a 65% reduction in symptom severity over the course of that one month. Again, drug trials are considered very statistically and clinically significant if you get a 25 to 30 percent reduction over the course of eight to 12 weeks. So this was quite remarkable in its um, sort of not only level of improvement, but the, uh, the rapidity. And one of my uh, sort of star patients, I won't claim she was typical, but she was absolutely memorable because the first night she came into the hospital, she went through three laundry carts. Her contamination fears were so severe and she very interestingly had a simultaneous fear that she was gonna catch AIDS from somebody or and it had generalized to anything red, any spot, anything else, and she'd be looking at her sheets and she would decide there was a little dot on there and it would be, have to be changed. She also had a fear, again, simultaneous with her fear that she was gonna catch AIDS, she worried she was gonna give somebody AIDS. And she picked at her cuticles so they were uh, sometimes she could see something that she thought looked like blood, and she'd have to wrap and rewrap Band-Aids around them until um, she was convinced. Those fears made absolutely no sense, and you can imagine that we thought, how on earth are we going to get her into the blood bank and do five single-volume exchanges over over the course of 10 days? But it was just a perfect example of the rational irrationality of OCD. She could tell you that it was stupid, and inconceivable that she could simultaneously have a fear she was gonna give somebody AIDS and that she was gonna catch AIDS, right? Because those two things are diametrically opposed and just as, just as nonsensically, she actually was able to tolerate being in the blood bank and watch her blood go in and out of her body. Well, I'm telling you that story because by the end of her two weeks with us, after her fifth treatment, she was completely cured. Her symptoms were completely gone. We had seen over the course of the two weeks that she was feeling much better, but I actually didn't believe her <laughs> and thought she's just trying to tell us what she thinks she wants, she thinks we want to hear. And so I kept pushing her and pushing her and pushing her with the questions, it's okay, it's all right, you can tell me if you still have any obsessive thoughts. And she was so frustrated with me. She walked over to the sharps box on the wall, which was filled with dirty needles, touched it and then licked her finger. Now, you just heard how rational irrationality was, so that shouldn't have been proof, but I, I think she was trying to make a point to me. Here's an easier visual example, and I, don't, I can't show you what these patients look like, um, but here's a 
the same degree of improvement in a patient with Sydenham chorea who was also treated with plasmapheresis. I don't know if you can see her toes, but I like the fact that as they try and help her walk, she has the chorea movements of her toes in, within her socks as well as her arms and hands. She had some degree of um, muscular weakness. That's why the research assistants is holding her up. In extreme cases, we actually had a couple of patients who met criteria for chorea mole, where they literally could not uh, raise their head off the bed. Well, because of that dis degree of disability, we had spent a long time trying to uh, arrange for belts and a wheelchair when she went home, but this is the way she was one week after finishing her plasmapheresis treatment. She had a tiny bit of chorea left on, on a stress neurologic exam, but was completely functional. And she went on to remain well, again, because she had Sydenham chorea with aggressive antibiotic prophylaxis. Well, I showed you the enlargement at baseline for the group of patients. This is a CT scan from a 14-year-old boy who had an abrupt onset of his panda symptoms following a two-week stint at soccer camp where he had a little bit of a sore throat and two of his tent mates had strep, but they didn't culture him. By the time he got home, he was spending 95% of his waking hours in obsessive compulsive rituals, particularly symmetry, uh, exer symmetrical exercising, trying to get the right half and the left hand of his body to be exactly the same. At baseline, there's a 20% enlargement of the size of the head of the caudate nucleus shown here which following successful treatment with plasmapheresis had reduced to normal. Of concern to me is the fact that we did a study in, the, in my early days at the NIH in the late 80s that documented that young adult men who had a very early childhood onset of their OCD with a course consistent with PANDAS actually had smaller than expected size of their caudate. And so one would con be concerned that that might represent an atrophic change to inflammation. It's very important at this point, and, and Dr. Mink and I talked at the break about how uh, we're all on the same page, and you heard that from Dr. Schlager, we're all on exactly the same page in that we want you to make sure that you're not ignoring standard treatments for these diseases, and you treat the symptoms. Well, I'm here to tell you that you don't want to treat PANDAS if it's not there, because it's going to be a waste of your time and money, and more importantly, it's going to expose our children to unnecessary risks of these interventions. This study is one that you can cite, and I hope you will. It was uh, done by myself and my colleagues at the NIH, in which we, following that amazing success with plasmapheresis for PANDAS, enrolled five children in an open-label trial of plasmapheresis but they didn't meet criteria for PANDAS. They just had regular OCD. And we stopped the trial after the first five because they had absolutely no improvement. Now, you have to understand, coming to the NIH is a big deal. We thought that this was going to work. Their parents thought there was going to work. You can't ask for a more placebo-intensive uh, procedure than plasmapheresis and being hooked up with the central line to a plasmapheresis machine every other day. Zero impact. So if there isn't an autoimmune process going on using an immunomodulatory therapy, even something as powerful as plasmapheresis is not helpful. All right, I say that because I have to share with you some, some disappointing results from our most recent uh, trial of IVIG. This was a multi-site trial at NIMH and Yale in which patients received their clinical care and their medical evaluation at the NIH and their psychiatric evaluation and all of the ratings were done by our colleagues at Yale through a video conference link. And it just happened that the way our video cameras were set up, our conference table and theirs were directly aligned and it literally looked like they were just sitting at the other end of the table, even though they were on the TV at, up in New Haven and we were down in Bethesda. We randomized 35 patients, 17 of whom received IVIG, and 18 received placebo. And you'll notice that there was a difference in baseline severity with the placebo group having slightly and almost statistically significantly more symptoms at baseline. It was not uh, statistically different 
but we did factor into the ANCOVA, so we corrected it through statistical means. We gave two grams per kilogram of IVIG. Again, this time, our families who received placebo actually um, on their exit interview were more often correct in knowing that they had gotten the placebo than that they had gotten the IVIG, despite similar precautions in, in having aluminum foil wrapped bottles and tubing. And the blinded ratings showed that the placebo group had improved and the IVIG group had improved. The means are not statistically different, so in that sense, this is a failed trial. The categories, however, were different in that the IVIG group actually had more improvements than the placebo, and the, um, there were more patients in the IVIG group that were, quote, responders than in the placebo. However, because it was so, we had a crucial flaw in the study, we decided not to continue it and try and get statistical significance on that difference between the two groups. The flaw was that every family was required to report a non-response in order to be eligible for open-label IVIG treatment. And we ended up with more than half of our children who had gotten IVIG having non-response non on their, on their uh, ratings. So rather than continue to work with a, a failed trial in that aspect, we decided to stop it and we're, we're working with others to try and design the better trial, which is more like our initial uh, Perlmutter study in which only patients who had received placebo were eligible for open label treatment. I think the uh, clinicians that we've showed this trial to have said, I don't know why you're focused on that so much because what you really need to point out is the fact that at 12 weeks, over 80% of the children met criteria for response to either open label or blinded IVIG administration, and on average, they were a mean reduction in symptom severity of 55%. Again, we're the NIH and we like to be critical of ourselves because we know it, it's important to do so. And my response to that would be, okay, so maybe it was the MECA effect. Most concerning would be that it was just good old tincture of time, time being T-I-M-E, right, not the spice, and that these patients would have gotten better anyway. So our new trial is actually to look at either plasmapheresis or IVIG, whichever seems clinically appropriate given the severity of the uh, symptoms, and the patients are randomized to a, a waiting condition or active treatment, and then again, blinded, randomized ratings done by a third neutral party at the end of the trial to determine which group actually had improvements. Having said that, I want to just go back and show you that in this placebo group, I don't think that two of our three placebos responders were, should be called placebo responders. They need to be called responders during the placebo phase. Because in both cases, they actually were improving on the antibiotics that they had been given. And you're gonna hear more from, from Dr. Murphy about that later. The antibiotic impact cannot be underestimated for this group of patients. And so we need to control that as well. For clinicians, it means that as Picacchiero and others had reported in their clinical sample, and as you'll hear from Dr. Murphy, a trial of antibiotics in a very clearly defined PANDAS patient can make a therapeutic difference. Here's a 12-year-old male. It's the best, closest I could do to showing you the same thing as that girl with Sydenham Korea, how they respond when they're going to respond to IVIG. And this boy came in. We, we fought about what, the, what his Y-box score should be. I lost, and so Yale and Paul Grant gave him a Y-box of 40, which is the very top on the Y-box score. And I said, I think you should give him a 38, because what if he gets worse? Well, he did get worse. When he came into us, he was still getting to school. He was able to uh, eat, albeit his mother had to scrub the floor with bleach, and he had to eat at a time separate from the rest of his family. And there were all kinds of just machinations to make that happen. But when he came back to us, he was unwilling to leave his bed because the entire house had become so uh, contaminated. And 
he was, had completely refused to leave the house. So here he is, and I, I must confess, I forgot that his primary symptom was contamination fears, because you're gonna see me give him a high, try to give him a high five, and if I had remembered that he didn't wanna to touch me, I probably wouldn't have made him do that. Oh dear, we can't hear him. I'm sorry, I'll show you later the video, because, oh, he's gonna help me. I actually can just tell you what he says. It's okay. Oh. He and his mother fight about whether or not he's 90% better or 95% better. And I just think it's a wonderful one. Anyway, I will show it later because I don't want to go over my time. The bottom line being that he was so significantly improved that he just uh, was back to his normal self. He was a swimmer. He was able to get back into the swimming pool. And in this case, we actually were able to watch this disease evolve over time and have seen him get worse on the placebo. Now, Hoekstra and his colleagues reported that IVIG was not effective for tick disorders, and just like our plasmapheresis for OCD, this is really important to remember, that if you don't have a PANDAS presentation, you don't have an autoimmune or misdirected immune response as the etiology for the symptoms, then immunomodulatory treatment is not going to be useful. Harry Shigani has actually shown that in patients with PANDAS, who are treated effectively with IVIG, that there are differences demonstrable using a PET ligand that is thought to measure neuroinflammation. At baseline, patients show uh, hyperactivity or binding of that ligand in the basal ganglia, particularly for PANDAS patients in the caudate and putamen, in Tourette's patients in the putamen alone, and following successful treatment with IVIG that that hyperactivity is absent. So what does it mean for your patients? What it means is history is absolutely key. Dr. Mink talked about the Lechman and Curlin studies. They didn't actually have abrupt onset. I was at the planning meeting for doing that trial, and Dr. Curlin uh, insisted that all ticks were acute and we couldn't distinguish them on that basis, so he was go using the episodicity. I told you about the mistake, and what the uh, entry criteria said was, using the published AJP criteria, which actually allowed you to make the diagnosis with uh, episodic course of illness only. If you don't have an abrupt, 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 dramatic onset of symptoms, with these comorbidities, you need to think of something other than pandas and pans. We've talked about the medical workup. Again, as you just heard on autoimmune encephalitis, these can be very uh, debilitating diseases, and so we need to make sure that you've done an adequate uh, diagnostic workup. Turn to the CANS paper, as Dr. Mink pointed out to you, and look at that differential diagnosis and make sure that you've considered each of those possibilities. This, like Sydenham Korea, is a diagnosis of exclusion. It is not your first uh, diagnosis. Medical workup, you're gonna hear uh, this afternoon about the abnormalities on polysomnography. I actually think that uh, doctor, my colleague, Dr. Ashura Buckley's findings, that these patients have disruptions of REM sleep in which they fail to develop atony during the REM phase may actually be pathognomonic. It may be extremely helpful to us in making this diagnosis and separating it from garden variety anxiety disorders and OCD because anxiety excuse me, children with anxiety may have a great deal of difficulty falling asleep because they've got the anxious thoughts running through their head, but once they're asleep, their sleep architecture is normal. And the EEG, we found abnormalities consistent with an AE kind of presentation in 17% of our patients. You need to do a lumbar puncture. If a child is as acutely ill as that little girl I showed you earlier at begging to be killed, if I saw her, I would want you to do a comprehensive medical and neurologic evaluation, and that does include a spinal tap. And then finally, management. 
You're not going to hear any data on this because to date we haven't figured out how to design this study on the in, uh, improvements seen after NSAIDs such as ibuprofen, naproxen, or even, dare I say it, aspirin. <laughs> For Sydenham Korea and rheumatic fever, aspirin was the only one of the NSAIDs that was helpful. We don't use it in our kids because of RISE syndrome, but RISE hasn't been reported for 20 years, so I think it might be appropriate to try it in a child who's this severely ill. We've had reports of good luck with uh, Benadryl and with the H1 and H2 blockers used in combination, as you would for a very severe allergic response. Short bursts of oral steroids almost as a diagnostic test more than anything, because to maintain them long enough, you would have to give them for one, two, three, or six months. We showed that in our trial for Sydenham Korea, in which oral steroids did suppress symptoms, but the children um, relapsed as soon as the steroids were removed. IVIG, even with the uh, sort of non uh, definitive data that we have to date. I do believe that it's useful for severe disabling cases of pandas and pans. I want to caution you that only one course has been studied. And I know there are some individuals out there who make a diagnosis of pandas pans and then proceed to treat the children every three to six weeks with IVIG, basically until the parents run out of money. It's just not warranted. The only time it would be warranted is if there is an immunodeficiency. And among PANDAS patients, it appears that an early immunodeficiency may increase your risk for this autoimmune phenomenon. That's known in other childhood autoimmune disorders. And about 10% of the patients uh, at the MGH clinic have meet criteria for immunodeficiency. If that were the case, then you'd be treating the immunodeficiency with recurrent courses of IVIG and hoping that the pandas would respond. But you do not treat this single time-limited illness with multiple courses of IVIG. Plasmapheresis, because it works so quickly, so well, and can really turn the child completely around, can be considered for life-threatening cases. What do I mean by life-threatening? I mean the child who is up on the roof trying to drop, jump off to kill themselves because of their suicidal thoughts. They've stopped eating, they're in the ICU for cardiac dysrhythmias, and you know for sure that you're dealing with this kind of illness than plasmapheresis. One of my colleagues out in Oregon has developed a very effective re-feeding protocol for the eating disorder symptoms in which she uses high-dose olanzapine and then literally an exposure with response uh, prevention where she refeeds them in tiny, tiny, tiny little uh, steps until they're able to eat. Melatonin may be useful for those sleep. They have a new onset of uh, insomnia that might be useful. Benadryl can do the same thing, at least short term. Anxiolytic medications, I'm gonna let Dr. Tienemann talk more about that, but I think that we shy away from them in pediatrics because we've all had that child who had the idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic response to a, a benzo and then is wild and out of control. But among children with pandas and pans, it can actually be uh, quite useful. Neuroleptics are, are sometimes helpful if the child has a severe movement disorder. Again, maybe Dr. Mink or Dr. Schlager can speak more to this. In our experience with uh, over 50 patients with Sydenham Korea, I didn't actually see that the neuroleptics were that helpful in suppressing the movements. And then supportive therapy. It is absolutely essential that you get those families as much help as quickly as possible. The stress levels in our families are beyond that for children who've been diagnosed with uh, a terminal case of cancer. And the more stressed they are, and the more in, they're incapable of establishing limits, the sicker the child is gonna get. So you have to have to have to give them the support for the tough love that they need to keep those symptoms under control. What do we do after the acute illness? Treat them like they have OCD, tic disorder, ADHD, anxiety disorder. It may only last three to six months, it may last two to three years, but during that time, you need to treat them. And my sort of analogy, because I'm a pediatrician by training, is pneumonia or cystic fibrosis, where you have things that you can do to get at the root cause of that child's symptoms, but you also do chest PT to break up the secretions. You give them a cough medicine if they're coughing and having a cold, and so you treat the symptoms as well as the core root causes.
Dr. Mink liked this slide, so I'm showing it again. You treat and prevent the infections, you treat the immune disturbances, and you treat the symptoms. And the only reason I'm not pounding on this podium is because I don't want to hurt your ears like I did when I turned my computer on. So with that, I thank you.